Okay. Is it... Uh... So we might get going now, and this is the time which your opportunity to get into the discussion. We've heard lots and lots of comments so far that you've heard resounding topics about the resilience you need to continue with this sort of career, why it's special, why it's better than just being a clinician all the time, why it makes you a better clinician. But there is still a whole host of topics we haven't touched on, and hopefully we'll pull this out with our um, exceptional panel. Now, we very carefully asked this panel to be here to show you different stages of the clinician scientist career. Um, and so we have Ruth here at the end, Ruth Mitchell, who is a PhD student and a neurosurgical trainee. So she is really in the midst of that hard time when you're doing your PhD, you're wondering what's happening to your clinical skills and how do you pull all that together. And then next to Ruth, we have Ken Pang, who is a paediatrician but also tra trained as a child psychiatrist. That's when we first met, met, met many years ago. And uh, he's done... Uh, quite uh, amazing research at Harvard, come back here and is now a clinician scientist at the, at the Murdoch. Uh, next we have Alif Akinshi, who is a, an adult endocrinologist, and I mentioned her before because she's doing some indigenous research, and we're very lucky she's here on the day of her uh, zero birthday party tonight, so it's very kind of her to give her up her afternoon when she's having, I don't know how many people over for a birthday party, so very kind of Alif. And then we have Pete Villeman on the right, who is um, a, a professor of general paediatrics. So just to tell you, the two um, uh, uh, panellists in the middle are both uh, mid-career, would you say, clinician scientists. And then we have Pete, who has just become a full professor about four months ago. He is professor of paediatrics at Deakin, is leading a very large study with many, many different prongs to that, um, and so brings a whole level of expertise. So rather than just all the uh, rather ancient people you've heard till now, here we have the young folks. So you can ask them, how do you do this? So I've asked them all to spend five minutes telling us about their story, and we might start with that. Ruth, do you want to go first? Certainly. Well, first of all, I just want to say it's just absolutely wonderful to be here. I am the furthest, furthest thing from a professor um, that you'll hear from today. So I feel very honoured to be um, on this stage and um, very honoured to be able to um, share a bit of my story and hopefully that will encourage you on your journey. So um, as Ingrid mentioned, I'm a neurosurgery trainee. Um, I went to Flinders University in South Australia for med school. Um, I moved to Melbourne as a resident to work at the Alfred, and then I went at the Royal Melbourne. Um, got on to neurosurgery training, um, second time I applied, so lots of disappointments along the way. Things don't always work out the way you want right at the beginning, um, and moved to Sydney for three years. Um, during my time in Sydney as a registrar, I realised how devastating it was um, looking after patients with glioblastoma, which is the most aggressive uh, brain tumour that we see in adult uh, humans. And... I got sick of having the family meeting, which ended in, you know, I'm sorry, this is the tumour that's going to limit your life. And I realised I wanted more than anything for there to be something more to offer my patients. And that's what made me turn my mind and my attention to the idea of doing some research on tumour biology. Um, and so I'm now in the third year of my PhD. I'm in the Department of Surgery at the Royal Melbourne and also at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. That's where I spend most of my time. Um, and I'm looking at one of the receptors, um, the epidermal growth factor receptor that has been mentioned already earlier today in the context of, um, of uh, uh, treating um, ectopic pregnancy. So it's a very biologically um, important uh, molecule. And uh, so I've been looking at how we might target that particular receptor better in glioblastoma. Um, and so I would say there have been lots of ups and downs on my journey, but it's a, a really wonderful um, thing to have the opportunity to explore both uh, a scientific career as well as a clinical one and um, I can only encourage you to consider doing the same thing and follow the questions that, that drive you the most. Thank you. Uh, so everyone, yes, my name is Ken Pang and um, I guess I wanted to start with a disclaimer and that is that you know, for most of the clinician scientists that I know, uh, you know they're clinical interests and their research interests directly overlap. Um, and thus they tell a story that's you know, both coherent and you know, in some ways synergistic. 
for my journey as a clinician scientist, you know, the path's been really quite different. So, you know, if you're looking for a career path that's uh, both efficient and uh, strategic, you probably should stop listening right now. Um, so I guess my journey into, you know, research really began as a high school student here in Melbourne. So I spent uh, one holidays at a uh, lab at the Baker Institute and, and loved that experience. And that really sort of whetted my appetite for research. I then w enrolled as a medical student at Melbourne Uni um, f with a view to sort of doing research long term. And subsequently, I did an optional Bachelor of Medical Science uh, in immunology. And again, I sort of loved that and really cemented in my mind, you know, this desire to, to, do, uh, to pursue a research career. So having then, you know, graduated from medicine, I initially toured with the idea of um, going straight into a PhD and abandoning my clinical career at that point. Um, for various reasons, I ended up continuing a, a little bit, um, doing some more for clinical training and finish my basic paediatric training. And at that point, decided to jump into the PhD, um, which uh, was really not so much driven by any particular clinical agenda, but was really more driven out of intellectual curiosity. And in particular, I was um, interested in this idea of, you know, what's all this so-called junk DNA doing in our bodies? So a very sort of basic science uh, PhD. Um, and at that point, uh, I decide, again was sort of left with the decision, do I go back and finish my clinical training um, as a paediatrician or not? And I decided to um, do a couple more years of, of training um, actually in child and adolescent psychiatry. Having then obtained my um, physician uh, letters, I have spent the next eight, my, pr pretty much the next eight years um, not doing any clinical work. Uh, and instead going back into the lab. And that saw me spend initially four years um, overseas at Harvard in the biology department there, uh, and then four years um, at the Walter Eliza Hall uh, back here in Melbourne. And again, the, my research interests through that time were driven by intellectual curiosity rather than any particular clinical agenda. So I, for example, was interested in this idea that, you know, RNA molecules may be travelling between cells, and I was interested in, you know, how does this process work and what might be the sort of functional implications of that. Um, now, uh, sort of come late 2015, I've sort of made a decision to change directions a little bit and at that point um, resumed clinical work. So I now work at the Royal Children's Hospital uh, part-time as a paediatrician, uh, looking after transgender children and adolescents. Um, at the same time, I decided in terms of my research career to, to shift focus a little bit and actually to do some research that was more aligned with my clinical interests. And so that now sees me at the, at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute trying to look at uh, research questions that help us better understand and, and manage things such as gender dysphoria and, and autism. So I guess just to recap, you know, in looking back on my sort of career to this point, uh, you know, my clinical and research interests have really been quite divergent. Um, and that's probably thrown up, you know, various challenges along the way. But at the same time, it's just allowed me to, um, I guess, indulge my intellectual curiosity and also make sort of discoveries in basic science that have both been, you know, intellectually very satisfying and also, you know, really fun. So with that, I'll... Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm Elif Ekinji. I'm an endocrinologist. I'm uh, head of diabetes at Austin Health. And um, I guess... I've got a very um, strong interest in Indigenous health, but I want to tell you a bit about how that sort of came about um, and uh, tell, tell you a bit about my story because I think it sort of explains where I am at the moment. So um, when uh, I was 11, my parents migrated to, uh, to Melbourne from Turkey and um, no one in my family spoke English, so we had to speak English and they, my parents went to um, learn English and their English teacher was kind enough to say, look, um, you know, you've come to this country, it's, a, you know, great, uh, but it's going to be hard for your children because they have to go to good schools and there aren't many of those um, unless you have a lot of money. <laughs> and, um, and the reason I'm telling you this is because... Um, uh, so that person actually said, look, there's this, ex there's this school that your daughter could go to. Um, it's called McCrobb. She has to sit an exam and, and um, <laughs> you could maybe try getting her in there and that, you know, that could set her up. Um, so, we, you know, we were living in the housing commission flats and there was a lot of things that I saw there, I guess, growing up in that sort of situation. And, um, and then I was fortunate enough to get into McCrobb and then, you know, um, that taught me a lot of resilience because I had to travel for an hour and a half every day to get to McCrobb and then back. And I'm sure a lot of people here from McCrobb um, in the audience because they typically get into medicine. Uh, but um, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. But the resilience, I think, is the key. And that um, understanding of like how um, if you have a medical, you know, if you have a, a problem that you have to deal with, um, 
uh, every day, like diabetes, where, you know, you have to constantly check your blood sugars and constantly have to worry about something like that. You need to have compassion in the treating team around you. And I think those experiences, early life experiences, taught me that. The most um, interesting thing that happened uh, to me was uh, we were sort of trying to uh, do more about Indigenous uh, health at that stage. And uh, a group of us, um, with Luke Birchall, who was one of the first Indigenous uh, medical students, who was a friend of mine and a couple of other friends, we got together and um, an Outlook was formed. And I was the Indigenous um, uh, health representative. And you might remember Outlook uh, is now one of the biggest organisations for rural remote. And that happened... Um, at, uh, when we were students. And um, I was fortunate enough to apply for this uh, thing called the John Flynn Scholarship, which um, as a medical student, I thought, oh, this sounds great. I'll go to um, Arnhem Land, you know, this will be fantastic. And I did. And, and I just saw all these really lovely young people dying from diabetes. I just couldn't understand. Like, there'd be people in their 30s having heart uh, strokes and heart attacks. And, and I just couldn't understand that in this country, you know, where, you know, I, there are opportunities for at major uh, tertiary or major cities, but in, in rural and remote places, um, this was taking the lives of very young people. Um, and and that sort of really made me interested in diabetes. Um, and then I was at medical school. I remember uh, Professor Jerems giving a lecture on diabetes and the complications, and I was just got all excited. This is this was for me. This was like diabetes is what I wanted to work on. And subsequently, um, uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, work... Um, with, uh, you know, Louise Maple Brown in, in, and go to remote and, uh, and I continue to go to uh, communities in Central Australia um, and we're setting up collaborations here in Shepparton to sort of translate the, the work that we are so successful in mainstream diabetes management to people where uh, they don't have all the opportunities. Um, so I guess uh, my uh, life's um, experiences have sort of um, shaped me in terms of the research I do. So my research is focusing on why some people get complications of diabetes, why others don't, what are the reasons, what, how can we detect these earlier, what are the treatments which would work. Um, it's clinical research, but I have uh, basic science collaborators, so, yeah. Thank you. Can, can you hear through the... Yeah. So um, I, I think I'm only really prepared to hold my place on the stage here being called professor for the last four months because Kit told us that he couldn't spell and I can't spell either. So that's filled me with a surge of confidence. And I, I think my, perhaps my major role is to assure you that if I can be a clinician researcher, any of you guys can. You know, there's, you're going to have areas where you feel like, well, I, I'm, I'm just so off the pace in terms of my ability to remember 50 million different drugs or my ability to do this or that. But if you're here, you're interested enough and you do have the capacity to do it, so pursue it. So I'm a, I'm a general paediatrician at Geelong Hospital and I day to day love the interaction between walking around on our ward and seeing all these kids with wheezing disorders and allergies and type 1 diabetes and then going back to the research group and spending our time tilting at scientific windmills trying to work out how do we stop the increase in immune-related diseases in the modern environment? And it's that dialogue between the research that we're doing and what we see on the ward round that is really exciting. I trained at the Children's Hospital. Um, I did a BMED Sci in which I was absolutely convinced that we were going to cure the world of sudden infant death syndrome. It didn't work at all, but it was a fantastic year. Through my training at the kids, I did a few different projects as they popped up. I, I did a study looking... We were interested in whether we really did need to do lumbar punctures in all these babies with um, urinary tract infections in the first months of life. And the dogma then was that's what you had to do. But like a lot of dogma, when you went and looked at the research, it was really dodgy research. So in between seeing patients as a resident, I pulled out all the data on... Um, on, on urinary tract infections and meningitis from the hospital and we, we found good evidence you really didn't need to do lumbar punctures in the vast majority. And that's when the hook started to go in because that's, that changed what we were doing in the hospital. And then I went on and uh, did a, a PhD toward the end of my training and I, I think one of the things I learnt from the, that process was the importance of going around and talking to lots of different people. 
because it really is the fish that John West rejects when it comes to picking your project and your supervisors. And I ended up with a, a fantastic project down in Geelong, but supervised by Mike South at the Children's Hospital. And one of the great joys of that was just those Wednesday telephone calls with Mike for an hour where we'd talk about what I was doing. And we just had this lovely relationship that went, you know, evolved over the years that we worked together. And we addressed this really simple question, which was, should parents of kids with asthma start their children on prednisolone when they think they're coming down with an asthma attack without waiting to see the doctor? And I spent four years of my life trying to answer that question in the Geelong region. And I remember sitting at home one night and it, it just really hadn't occurred to me that it was all going to come together that night while I was sitting there working on the couch, but I got sent the code for breaking the randomisation and pushed a button and all of these data analysis I'd been putting together for years popped out the answer and I, bloody hell, it worked. And I, I yelled out, Trude, it worked, it's my wife. And she said, oh, that's great, what? <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> my PhD. And she goes, oh, that's good, can you put the washing out? <laughs> But they're the moments that make it absolutely worthwhile because you see something in the data that's real and you know that you and the people with, that you've worked with have, uh, have managed to make that thing occur. And it's there. It's there for everyone in the world. So now I run a birth cohort study called the Barwon Infant Study. My primary interest is in the relationship between the bacteria in the mum's gut and the baby's gut and how that trains the baby's immune system and how we might be able to manipulate that, that back, those bacteria to prevent allergic diseases, asthma and type 1 diabetes. Great. Well, thank you very much for the lovely intro. OK, so now it's over to you. We have two fantastic runners for the microphone, Aidan and Eddie. And I would like, every, as soon as you've got a question, put your hand up and then we'll just keep this thing moving. I've got a bunch of questions as well that we need to sort of cover those topics, but we'll start over here. Anyone else got a question? Just put your hand up as you think of one. This question is a bit late for me personally, but I just think it might be something other people are interested in. What do you think is the ideal time in your career to do a PhD? I think for a lot of us, and a lot of the speakers have commented on that they didn't really expect to ever do one, and then someone just suggested it, and they said yes, and that's exactly what happened to me as well. But I just wonder, a lot of us are kind, kind of trying to combine getting our letters in whatever specialty we're training in, or getting onto a training program, or whatever it is in one part of our career, and then trying to focus on the research. And so trying to, the logistics of combining that. OK, well, let's take it from Ruth and we'll walk down. Sure. I think it's a really great question. And I thought about it a lot when I was a resident because I knew I wanted to do a PhD. I didn't necessarily know in what, but I knew I did want to do one. And um, I knew I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. So I thought, how am I going to make this work? Um, and I asked a lot of people. And, and I think the answer that I kind of, the average of the answers is, is what I've ended up doing, which is, for a surgical trainee, probably about halfway through your training is, the, is, is probably an optimal place. There's nothing perfect about it, um, and there are downsides, but getting established in surgical training takes some years. It takes time to get on. Um, once you're on, you want to make sure that you've passed your primaries and you've got sort of, you've established yourself as someone who's a serious contender that you're planning to complete um, before you ask for time off to do a PhD. Um, the, so now I will go back to full-time clinical work next year and I'm worried that I will have lost some of my ability to operate and I certainly don't think I'm nearly as slick taking referrals or running a ward round or running a ward but I hope to um, continue to be a fast learner with that so I think um, any later would be problematic in surgery. I think different disciplines though um, it, it may be quite different. That's just my personal What about feeling. you Ken? You've had an interesting path. As I said, I've sort of thought about doing a PhD at different time points um, and ended up doing it straight after basic um, physician training. And I think that's probably unusual. Most people, I think, as Pete alluded to, tend to do it towards the end of their training so that you know, some of their PhD ends up counting and they get their letters um, you know, halfway through their PhD, whatever the case might be. I think for me, I was just really keen to get into the lab and sort of you know, made a decision that wasn't necessarily strategic. Um, but, and at the same time, 
I guess the one potential downside to doing it when I did it was then having gone back to clinical work you know, and then having already received my PhD, a lot of things like fellowships and things all date from the time you get your PhD. So if you then spent quite a bit of time doing clinical work, that doesn't sort of, you know, count really. That doesn't really help you when you're then end up, you know, moving on to a sort of more senior category and you're, you're competing against people who have spent all that time, you know, in, in the lab. And Ken, you talked about dropping medicine, I think I heard, and continuing science. Are you pleased you came back? Yeah, look, I, I am. I mean, I think it, it, it sort of, again, I think depends on what your priorities are. You know, there's, you know, lots of um, people who are trained in medicine and, and gone into research quite early on and then never really, you know, done any clinical practice. And, you know, here in Melbourne, there's, there's lots of great examples of that. Um, and, you know, if, if your interest is in, you know, un, for instance, basic science and understanding some of those fundamental questions, I think that's a really good, you know, path to take. If, if I just think of, you know, some examples at the WEHI, we've got someone like Don Metcalf who, you know, after graduating from medicine in Sydney, you know, was interested in this question of how do blood cells get formed and, you know, his discoveries ended up uh, leading to, you know, the um, identification of, you know, colony stimula stimulating growth factors that are now used routinely in terms of um, helping people's blood counts recover after chemotherapy. And so, you know, that's a profound discovery. You know, just more recently, um, just this week, in fact, at the WEHI, they announced a $320 million licensing deal for a new drug called Venetoclax, and that came out of discoveries made in the 80s, for instance, by David Vo, who, again, trained in medicine, ve ve did very little practice in medicine, but was interested in, you know, why do cells die? And he, he was studying a molecule called BCL2, and, and that... Um, it's now a drug that blocks BCL2 that's been licensed, you know, for, for that amount of money and has shows a lot of promise in, in terms of leukaemia. So you can make discoveries that are really very important without necessarily having gone and done, you know, your further clinical training. And again, it just comes down to what your, I think, interests are. Great. Lee. Um, I guess the thing I'd like to add is... Um, uh, Physician endocrine training, you know, is long. Um, there is the potential of using at least one of your years towards your PhD, and I'd highly recommend that. Um, a PhD is also a great time to have children. I had two children during that time, and then one later. Um, and you, can, you know, and I was, I, I would highly encourage that time for women to consider that time. It's more flexible. You don't have to work really long hours, and um, yeah. Um, but um, I think uh, do some clinical training would be my advice initially. It might not be the whole, whole thing, but do some clinical training. Great. Pete, Pete's yeah. wise. Believe you. I, th I think, as in many things in life, it's important to realise there are lots of different ways to skin a cat. So there's not one path you can take and, and you need, don't need to be so... to feel anxious about taking the wrong path. Research is something where opportunities and relationships crop up and you get taken down a path you might never have expected to. Having said that, um, I think it does work well to do a PhD toward the end of specialty training, if that's what you're doing. It's nice to have got you past the, the clinical quiz and have that monkey off your back, and to have, during that period, a real focus on acquiring your clinical skills, because you, you will never quite have that focus again that you do for that period, and, and, and I think that deserves all of your attention. Um, then the fallow years are a really nice part of training. It's, it's, it's a period where you have a more senior clinical role, but you're not a boss yet. And you get to think interesting ideas and spend time working on them. So that's a really nice time to be doing a PhD. You can double dip and get some time for, um, for, for your training from, your, from a PhD, and, which is what I, I did and I think is definitely worth doing. You can also uh, moonlight, do locums in the emergency department or in Terelgum, which is where I wrote most of my PhD, and that allows you to pay the bills. And for dads too, it's a good time to, when you've got little kids. I, I had little kids during the um, period that I was doing my PhD, which meant I could, you know, sit around in jammies writing a Cochrane review at home and it mix that experience of spending enough time with your kids with trying to change the world from your living room, so it's, I, I think that works well. Yeah, um, I agree. I think also, I'm, as I said at the beginning, I'm keen on clinical research, and you have to be a clinician to be able to do clinical research. So, in fact, being towards the end of your fellowship means you bring your clinical expertise to the question, and you're already skilled in that, so I think it, it's a great time. All right, can we have some more questions? Yes, over there. Eddie, you'll run round there, won't you? <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. <laughs> Uh, 
as a woman, how do you balance family workload of a clinician scientist? Okay, so we're going to direct that to Alif straight up because she's uh, got three children and a clinician scientist. So tell us about how you make it work. But the rest of you, I want to hear about your work-life balance so you're not off the hook. Yeah, um, I think... Um, so I think if... Uh, this is a key piece of information I'd like to give. If you're a nice person, then the world generally tends to behave nicely to you. So if you set up your supports around you... Um, have good friends, you know, good family members, good relationships set up, um, then things are not as hard um, down the track. And, uh, and um, you know, we've, we've um, really done great, uh, I guess, with our nannies. Like, we have two part-time, and they've been fantastic people. And I think to keep get those type of people to stay with you and to look after your kids, I mean, it's a really, it's quite a big deal. Uh, you know, you're not there and anything could happen, especially if they're toddlers, like, it's stressful. Um, uh, but to to make sure that that person is caring for them, not just caring, but loving them, and, and that you have to have people that you really trust. And I think having those key people around makes a huge difference. And we um, uh, essentially have a lot, we, we spend a lot of money on help. So, you know, my husband works full time. Um, he's a GP, uh, but um, how we've done it is that, um, t like two uh, two days a week, I pick them up. He picks them up two days a week, and then one day the nannies do. And in the mornings we have um, a lot of support. They come up usually to our house at seven thirty, and they prepare the meal. Like we pay them more than you know, um, uh, and they're called they're now. They're, they're, those types of people are called higher and nonna. So you can actually <laughs> oh, there's a website for this type of thing, higher and nonna. And one of our um, fantastic people is a nonna actually, um, but she, she, she's fantastic. And then we have cleaners on top of that, and then we have all our groceries delivered. So I'm telling you all the all of this because this is the time. Because at any time I don't have to go shopping or think about when the milk's coming and the bread's, you know, arriving, means I can have time to either take the kids to school or, you know, spend quality time, make sure that they're doing their readers and, you know, pick them up and make sure they're playing the piano and things like that. So essentially outsource as much as you can uh, and work with people who are really good people. Um, outsource as much as you can in the sense that, you know, like the gardening or all those types of maintenance things. Um, and then, yeah, just choose really good people to help you. I'm going to just add a little bit there. I know that I'm on the panel, but um, I, I like to call my life that of an anti-role model um, because of trying to get work-life balance. But I agree completely about you need supports in place. And I used to worry as a paediatrician, what happens if my child, I'm not around this child all the time to make sure the child grows and develops normally. One of them is running around here, so you see he's grown and developed normally. But I, I think it's really important to have a stable group of people around your children. It doesn't have have to be you as a mother or you as a father. I think that's really important. We likewise had long-term nannies that were part of the family and they still remain in contact and they still care about the kids, etc. And I think cleaning ladies are all important. Can't tell you, was day I became an intern, I got a cleaning lady. And it really is a really wonderful investment in your sanity and your relationship with your husband too, or the other way around. So cleaning ladies are critical and supports. And, you know, we had a bit of grandparent involvement. We only had grandmothers alive, but they were both key figures. Um, and that may not be possible for everyone, but it's about a stable environment. It's not about it having to be you um, and that they know that, you know, you're still managing everything um, probably far too much. I think it still falls to the women, but we'll let the men defend themselves. So um, uh, let's... Pete, Pete, do you want to talk about um, being a parent, I think, in, in this career and how you make that work? Yeah. So I always struggle a bit with the idea of work-life balance because um, I think from my... I, I, I struggle with it as an idea on a sort of everyday basis. So for me, I quite like periods of work-life imbalance. I, I like periods where I am absolutely obsessed with an idea and you're quite out there in your headspace. You're so focused on what you're doing and that's part of being passionate about it and, you know, my daughter coming out and finding me up in my pyjamas working on NHMRC grant at five in the morning when I've been up for the last few hours, that's fine. As long as at other times you set aside time to really genuinely be with your kids and, and be with your partner. And so at some point, I think about five, six years ago, one of my colleagues said, 
they have a family holiday every 10 weeks and as soon as they come back they plan the next one and it might be a camping trip down to the prom, it doesn't have to be to Tahiti. And so that's, but, you know, that's been a key thing for, for me that I've, um, we've had really regular family holidays we often just go camping and I try really hard to have times when I'm properly present, you know, and properly helpful. Um, but I don't deny myself the fact that at other times I'm not. Other times I'm, uh, I've got my head down trying to change the world. And that's all right as long as my kids can sort of be a part of that and see that it's all right that Dad's a bit nuts. That's, that's the way he is because at other times he's, he's not. That's great, Ken. I'd certainly echo what others have said in terms of building up supports, outsourcing, and in terms of adding some other points, I think um, there's a few things. So Tony Burgess is actually Ruth's uh, PhD supervisor at the moment. He's been a sort of long-term mentor of mine. He was previously um, director of the Ludwig Institute. And, and Tony said something to me many years ago that has sort of always stuck with me. And you know, he was the director of an institute from a pretty young age. And he said, look, for, come Friday night to Saturday night, I don't do any work. You know, he had you know, young kids and, um, and I've, I guess in some ways, you know, very much tried to stick to that um, insofar as, so I, I have kids who are six and four and uh, while I you know, work hard during the week, during the weekends I just say, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, as much as I can, not going to work from you know, Friday night to, to Sunday night. And I think having that time um, is important to recharge and you know, similar to what Pete was just saying, and I guess at the same time, as a, as a simple thing, I, I always take my annual leave. You know, there's, there's lots of people, you know, within the hospitals who've accumulated months and months of, of annual leave. I, I make sure I get away and, you know, enjoy that time. And I think that's again important. You certainly work really hard through the year, um, but having time away is, is really important. Um, that um, I do the same thing. I don't check any emails generally or anything on the weekends. Um, and we've found going away, uh, we go down to the peninsula a lot, but that's really helped us as a family and just doing walks and things like that. That, that those times have really... There's actually, yeah. actually a literature about how important um, holidays are for families, that you do actually set aside those times where there's no emails, there's no other distraction, there's just you and a monopoly set... While we're on this family questions, I just wanted to ask you about juggling your career. Now, I don't know what your wives do, but I believe you said your husband's a GP. Has that been a, a struggle? I should mention the last two professors that spoke both have professorial wives. So you can imagine how much of a struggle it is. You know, are you going to a conference that week? Are you home that week? Who's going to look after the kids? Are we both in the aeroplane at the same time? So I'm just interested if you've had struggles. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, my, my husband's incredibly supportive. He's, um, you know, he, he's really highly respected GP. He doesn't do research, but, he, you know, he's got a full load. Um, and we do have those issues. But um, he, he's, he hasn't specifically been interested in doing academic medicine. So he sort of said, look, you just go, go with it and I'll help you. And he's been great. He's a fantastic person. So I think, yeah, finding that and having those discussions early on, we did have those discussions early on, like way early on, even before we got married. Um, yeah. And Ken or Pete, did you have comments? He said, my wife's a GP too. Um, she is part time and we kind of tag team in the sense that on the nights that Trude works as a general practitioner, she's often not home till eight o'clock at so, finishing up all the paperwork and then on the other nights I mightn't get home. Our kids have sort of been trained to, trained to have a sort of Spanish dietary pattern and we have dinner really late so we often still manage to have dinner together. Um, so, and, and Trude, I think Trude, one of Trude's gifts to me is she's not particularly understanding of me being too distracted so she will say, no, that's enough, stop now and she'll get cross with me and that's good because that um, brings me into check. Yeah, and I think sometimes do you, I think sometimes one has to give one career a, a go for a while and then the other one so you can move across. When I watch my colleagues in that situation, a couple of years your career takes precedence, a couple of years the other person's. Yeah, I'd certainly you know, echo those sentiments. So my wife initially trained as a lawyer and then as a GP and more recently as a palliative care physician. Um, and so she's just finishing that off right now. So she's been doing six months... The last six months has been full-time as an oncology registrar. Oh, um, my gosh. So I've been doing 
all the pick, uh, drop-offs, you know, five days a week, and sort of similar to what Ingrid said, it's just a matter of, you know, figuring out what works best at the time. And, and the other thing that I sort of wanted to add was, you know, something that we've done sort of throughout our relationship from the time before we were married and then even, you know, in, in recent years is actually gone to see someone professionally to say, yeah, you know, sort of like a couples counsellor type person, but not that there were ever, you know, specific problems or issues, but just to help us, you know, have a third party think about, you know, the issues that you start to, you know, become blind to. And, you know, so we end up, for instance, having discussions around, you know, quality family time and, you know, what might be the impact of um, two busy professionals on the, on the kids and how it might be for them as an experience. And, and so that's something that we've found very helpful. And again, it's not been sort of crisis driven, but it's just been having a space to think about, you know, as parents and as, as a couple, you know, how we can, you know, potentially do things better. I think that's very innovative. We, I think we have a question over here. Uh, hey there, I've got two questions. First one um, to you, Ken. I was reading in the program, you've um, been a Fulbright Scholar and had spent a bit of time in Harvard. Just interested to hear a bit um, how that opportunity came about and um, how you found your time at Harvard. And then there's a follow-up question to the rest of the panel. Uh, clinical research um, versus lab-based research um, among the, you know, especially in the medical community, is one type of research favoured over um, another? Great. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I, post-PhD, was looking at, uh, you know, at what I wanted to do um, during my postdoc, and I sort of chose to leave the field that I'd been um, focused on during my PhD and was interested in looking at other questions. So I ended up at Harvard simply because... Um, I'd read about a protein that I thought was potentially fascinating and I wanted to study that protein. This was a protein that had been discovered you know, initially in worms um, and um, it had this sort of amazing ability to move RNA across cell membranes and um, it allowed, in, in particular, this process called RNA interference to occur and to spread. And I was interested in, again, it's a very basic science question, you know, how, could this be working in humans? And um, so really just sought out that lab, went to visit the lab had a chat to them, and then from there sort of organised um, to move over and, um, you know, having had a reasonably successful PhD, was in a strong position to then get a, an HMRC fellowship and a Fulbright scholarship. So having my own sort of fellowship moving over made things easy because you know, I'm bringing my salary um, and, you know, labs are generally pretty happy if, you know, they're not having to pay for your salary. Um, so that was essentially how I ended up at Harvard and, you know, I loved my time there. I was, I was there for four years. It was, I did no clinical work through that time and, you know, I was conscious that I was doing basic science. I didn't want to try and juggle clinical work and, and basic science. I think that's a very difficult thing to do when, you know, there've been, when there's such different interests as, as it's been the case for me. Um, so I've just pretty much focused when I was, certainly when I was there, I just focused on the basic science. And the second question, Johnson, just... Clinical, so um, when you're looking at um, choosing a clinical project, um, you know, Peter, you've done a predominant, you know, your, the flavour of your research is very sort of clinically based, whereas Ruth, your project's a bit more sort of lab based. Um, within, I guess, the medical community, do you think there's a um, bias towards, you know, is um, clinical research favoured over um, uh, lab based research or vice versa? Ruth, I'll let you take so I think this is an excellent question. Um, the vast majority of my, say, former neurosurgical bosses think I'm insane. I mean, they think I'm insane, like, generally. Um, <laughs> but they also thought it was a bit nutty that I'm taken on an incredibly lab-based project. Um, now, that's because they haven't done structural biology, so they don't know that it's almost as good as neurosurgery. Um, and that's fine. I can help explain it to them. But, um, you know, I'm incredibly grateful that I've been given a chance to do something that is really, truly lab-based and is, you know, structural biology, biochemistry, you know, right in the, in the nitty-gritty of thinking about what pH you're going to elute at, that sort of thing, and getting to learn how to use an electron microscope. It's, it's very nearly as good as operating on people's brains. And I think that to get to do two such wonderful things is amazing. And if you think to yourself, oh, but I better do research that's super clinical, that translates tomorrow, then you limit yourself. Um, and it's also a comment about picking your mentors very wisely, because there are lots of people who have opinions about what you ought to be doing with your life, which are basically only coming from their own experience. Um, and I think thinking broadly, thinking creatively, thinking outside the square is, is probably the only way we're going to move things forward. And I know that I can add things in the structural biology division at the WEHI because I operate on people that no one else there can bring. 
So there's a lot of really interesting cross-pollination that goes on there and a lot of sort of the potential for some real inter intellectual rigor that you would miss out on if you listen to the advice, which is prevalent, that you should make sure your research is really just one step removed from the bedside. That's my opinion. Well, it's interesting because when I trained, I got the sense that clinical research was second rate, so you're giving me the opposite message. Ali. Uh, now, at this stage of my career, I sometimes think I wish I had done basic research. Um, not that I want, you know, I have any regrets about what I've done, but in terms of um, at a molecular level, um, it's very hard to answer those questions. So I um, was just, you know, I've been thinking about how we can develop certain models or do that like after years of sort of clinical research. And I think my um, answer to that is now. I'll be, collab and I do collaborate already with basic scientists, but um, more actively in, and co-supervising um, yeah, PhD students with basic scientists um, who would provide that extra input. So I think as clinicians, we have questions and when we read papers, you know, we, we think of targets, but it's just hard to find those models where you can't, it's very hard to do both. I mean, uh, it's a very limited number of people who could do that. Uh, there's one of them there. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, and Ingrid, yourself? Well, no, I don't do any basic research. I just work with wonderful scientists that do. And I'm very fortunate that they're really bright. But we also have critical mass. So we have team, we get together. The CIs on our program grant, I think there are nine of us. Um, and we get together and we brainstorm people. I've just found this, what do you think of this? And then we go, well, I pull in this piece of information from my clinical work, et cetera, and it just builds. And that's, that's super exciting and also great fun because you have friends in the world of science and research and you're making a story together, which is great. Pete? Well, I think there are no rules, so do what you're good at. You know, you know, one of the questions you need to ask yourself, someone said to me once about lab work, is whether you're a, you're a cook or a chef. And I'm a cook in that I don't think I would be very good at p accurately pipetting the same 10 micron <coughs> amount of fluid each time. I'm good at other stuff, um, which allows me to work with people who are good at, uh, who are chefs, who are good at basic science. So I think it's really important to spend a little bit of time in the room of mirrors and say, what, what actually am I good at? What do I enjoy? And don't go and do something else because someone said that's what you have to do to have a research career. If you are doing what you enjoy doing, you'll do it well. And then you'll be able to collaborate with people who can fill in the, in the gaps and you'll be able to be useful to them. Yeah, and I'll just add a little bit about clinical research. I mean, I thought I'd be terrible at research, but I love clinical medicine. And what I'm good at is seeing a patient and seeing what that patient's telling me that's different to the last patient or that's different about the scientific basis and then talking to my science, basic science colleagues, my lab science colleagues, and they look at them further or we'll put them in the MRI and look at their imaging further. So that's my skill set, is to pull out that point that that patient is telling me that is telling me about the science. Or going back when we find a gene, or I don't find the gene, the scientists find the gene, I go back and pull all the patients in together and say, well, what is the phenotype of that gene? So I, I think that we need both. We need both uh, basic science and clinical science. We've got some more questions. Oh, thank you. Well, there is some more around here, Aidan, if you want to come around. Uh, so... <sighs> You guys have talked a bit about uh, your family life and all that, um, but there's been a lot of uh, presenters so far that completely emphasise going internationally. Can you have... Um, how do you balance uh, going internationally for several years at a time with whatever family commitments, which might also be, uh, I guess, career-motivated? Your better half, that is. Um, yeah, how do you balance that? Like, how do you come to a conclusion that it's okay to go into, in, in, well, internationally for years at, at a time? Ken, do you want to have that? I guess, look, uh, uh, it was certainly uh, my doing that we went to the US. My, my wife sort of didn't go quite kicking and screaming, but she wasn't that keen. Um, she had just finished general practice training and she knew she was interested in palliative care and... 
decided that, you know, okay, she'll apply and, and see if she can, you know, do some clinical work there. And, and that worked out really well for her and, you know, and she loved her time there. Um, but we, I think, saw it as an adventure. We, we said, we'll be here for a certain number of years. We, we always thought we would come back to Australia. Um, and uh, it was, again, just a sort of a discussion that um, we had around, you know, let, let's go and do this together. Have any of you, others of you been overseas for a period? I wasn't yeah. sure. Uh, yeah, my, my husband and I, we took a year off after um, second year and, and worked in the UK because back in those days you could still do that without having to do all the exams. And we had a great year, actually. We, had, we travelled and just travelled all around the, uh, Europe. And, and um, I think after that experience, I thought, uh, coming back, thinking, uh, you know, that was really good, but I don't think I could take just... I just really wanted stability, maybe because of my life, early life experiences. But I didn't. I never. I've, I knew I never wanted to leave Australia, and, and knowing that that's, um, I guess, has maybe some negative um, implications on my career and, and lack of the international collaborators. So I'm trying to find ways of spending some time um, overseas. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be doing that, I guess, down the track. Um, there's opportunities like you can take six months um, yeah, long service leave. Sabbatical. Sabbatical. Yeah. yeah, I think going overseas is absolutely brilliant experience and I think it's life-changing. I think Australia is parochial, much as I love our country, um, and we're a big fish in a small pond and it's really important to network. So I think going overseas actually for two years is better than one year and that's partly because when we lived in London I noted that their friends who came for one year, from the day you arrived they were leaving, but once you coming for two years, you know you've got to make it home. It's just a whole different mindset. So we get lots of fellows from all over the world. We're getting about six in the next two months, I think. And we always try and ask them to come for... We've just got one last week from the US for a year, but I try and push for longer. It's really difficult for our fellows to come in because of our visa laws are just shocking, shockingly difficult, as I'm sure many people here know. But I think going overseas is super important if you can manage it with your life. And the other thing is, one thing that hasn't come out enough today, I think, is the importance of international collaboration. We've talked a lot about collaboration and teamwork. But I have friends all over the world, really good friends, and I see them regularly because I travel so much and we collaborate, we have lots of international projects. And in 2017, science is international, so it's very important to create, to, to create, create your networks and keep that collaboration ongoing. Now we have a question there. Oh, so okay. Being exposed to how things are done overseas can be really helpful. You know, so I was in, you know, in Boston and um, quite aside from seeing the sort of basic science and what was going on there in terms of technology and other things, it was just fascinating to be in that space where you've got Harvard and MIT and you've got lots of incubators, you've got lots of startup companies that are being spun out of the discoveries from those labs. And you know, that's something that we don't do very well here in Australia in terms of you know, um, commercialising some of our, our basic discoveries. and. Um, it was really interesting for me to, to be able to see that quite apart from, you know, the science that I was doing. Yeah, I think it's a great point. So this might be a bit of a silly question, but please bear with me. So I, tra so I grew up in India, went to New Zealand, and I've come here for my fellowship, and I go back to New Zealand. I've always found it really interesting when I first contact people, like someone you've met at a conference, or is there an unwritten set of rules on how to email people or call someone that you found really interesting and you found their talk really interesting, is there a certain way to approach people that you find works better than others? Pete, you want to check that? I, I think I'm... I mean, I seem to have a group of people who I work with that, where that's gone really well. But I, I must say, I think of myself as terrible at networking. You know, I'm, I'm just not good at kind of going around and handing out my business card and <laughs> sending follow-up emails. So... I mean, for me, I think it's the approach I've taken is just to be sincere, you know, just go and talk to them. And it, there's nothing like actually meeting a person and just being interested in what they're doing and being prepared to put your ideas forward. And then, sure, send, share, send a, a follow-up email, but take the time to make it a, a thoughtful email with, you know, some of your ideas in it. Be, be prepared to, you know, be critical of something they've said to you. Mate. Show them that you've got something to bring to the table, that you're not just trying to look keen, 
that you're actually genuinely interested. And I think, I think that approach, just approaching it as you do any other um, interaction in life, seems to seems to serve it served me well that approach. So that I don't have a million different collaborations, but the ones that I've got have been good, and the the basis of them has been friendship. Anyone else want to add? Yes. So certainly I've had the experience of emailing um, someone who I had I'd read a number of um, this person's papers and I was really interested in, in some of the work they'd been doing and thought it would probably help my work. And I wrote like three or four different emails and didn't get any response. And um, I told my supervisor and my supervisor wrote an email. And then all of a sudden I got a very nice, detailed, very, very friendly <laughs> reply. So the reality is sometimes you're not going to get a response from someone on your own strength because of how their brain works or how they think about things. Um, or maybe they just aren't great with their emails. Um, and I think that you have to be prepared for not getting a response or for having to go, hey, Tony, can you, do you mind? Like, what do I do here? And I think that that's, that's where having good seniors and sponsors for your career is really important because sometimes someone does need to kind of encourage communication. I think that's a real thing. Oh, I'm pleased you said that, Ruth, because I'm going to have my tuppence worth. I think often when you're on your side of the fence, you're not thinking about the people on my side of the fence who's getting 100 emails a day. And I don't even begin to look at my first email till 9 or 10 at night, as Aidan knows well with organising this conference. He just knows that I... And then I don't read them all anymore because I just can't. If I want to sleep and function, I can't. And my clinical work gets in the way of my research all the time and I'm constantly trying to contain it. So I always tell people now, if you want to contact me, don't email me once. Keep emailing me so that you get at the bottom and you get in my head as, you know, somebody that really wants this contact. And I'm sure, like me, you get five emails a day inviting you to submit chapters to rubbish journals and to attend rubbish conferences. And these are real, not real anymore. This is just complete spam in your inbox, which makes it even harder. Harder. And sometimes my secretary picks it up and says, is this important? I go, no. And then sometimes I'm getting something that's really important and trying to sieve out what's real versus what's not real is almost impossible. A real editorial board invitation for Annals of Neurology versus 25 rubbish journals. And this is a, a huge dilemma for us. So the first thing is the person you wrote to, it probably just went down the inbox. The second thing is it's about connectivity and that's why I mentioned the international issues because you have to travel if you're in Australia. You have to be at the conferences. Being on a call is not the same as being in the room by any stretch of the imagination. And I think your boss got the response because he knew the people. And, you know, recently I got a three-year-old child into a trial of a drug in, in Rome and he's got a, a terrible progressive disorder that will kill him. And the reason he got into this trial is because the guy that was running it in Rome is in the epilepsy genetic space with me and we're sort of mates and competitors, which is sort of normal in this world. So life is about connectivity and you've just got to accept that. And if you don't get a response, you get somebody who'll know that person to help you. And it's not that they're being arrogant. It's just that they only have so much time in their day and that you need to get to the top of their inbox. And I think we had another question over here somewhere. Ah, yes, over there, please. Aidan, a bit of a run for you. Thanks for this interesting session. I guess I'm probably a little bit different from most people here, as in I'm a youngish uh, clinician scientist just finished. Um, but I was going to ask more in terms of what now from here? You are a clinician scientist, so now it's you got to get grants and all of that. Where would you go to um, uh, help, uh, get people to help you with that, find the right topics and um, get the money to run the scientific side of your clinician scientist life? Pete, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it I comes back again to what you're good at and what you're interested in. Um, and I think, again, there are lots of different ways to do it. The way that I've done it is to set up a program that was particularly suited to where I worked clinically, so that I, I was bringing the 
strength of the Barwon region as a setting for epidemiology to all of our grant applications. And then I collaborated with people who had serious track records and, and were, were very good. And that was the formula that allowed us to get funding. So I think you need to think very critically and seek a lot of advice about how you might put together a project that really does have a realistic chance of being funded. And it's that mixture of you bringing something intellectually, something about the logistics and the feasibility of your project that's special, that, and also that you're then collaborating with people who are really world class that will allow you to be in that very small portion of Australian grants that get funded. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with that, and I think um, you know. If, so one of the things that you uh, struggle with after you finish your PhD is try to get funding for your fellowship, um, and so that immediate time after the PhD is um, scary and daunting because if you want to really do research, you can't. It's unless you know, it's hard to do it without funding um, because you always justify it, need to get funding and need to do clinical work. So, um, so for me. Um, uh, I did get a, uh, an HMRC fellowship, uh, early career fellowship, which, um, but, uh, you know, there's also this time where you can't apply immediately. So there's, you know, some time uh, you have to wait a year or so if you've missed a deadline or whatever. Um, and during that time you'll be unpaid and you have to make those decisions. Like, unless you already have a hospital-funded position, that, that's an issue. So if you can get over that initial um, uh, time where you decide, yes, you really want to do research, yes, OK, then apply for fellowships. Um, and then, then you still have. I think you need to have to publish to get publish, and then apply for little grants, and 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 then you know, and then collaborate with people who are getting the big grants. Um, it's it's not that easy. So tell us about your fellowship. Or what's it's the Sir Edward? Dunn oh, so again? that that one. Um, so my initial uh, an HMRC fellowship was um, uh, in diabetes and in diabetes complications here in Indigenous Australians. So that's. Um, uh, with um, Menzies, and then subsequently, um, uh, I was fortunate because one of the professors was retiring, um, and there's an opportunity to fund a person to do the diabetes clinical research and clinical trials. So then, I could apply for that position. Yeah. Right. Did you want to add anything? I guess coming back to that part of your question, which was, you know, what do I, what do I do next? Sort of similar to what Pete said, I think you need to find, you know, what are you really interested in? As you know, we heard from earlier, for instance, Stephen Jane spoke about, you know, his work's been 25 years in, and, and there's been lots of up and downs, and you want to be passionate about what you do. You don't want to study it because you think that it's the, you know, sexy topic or something. You, you want to be passionate about it because there's going to be ups and downs, and you, you want to need to, you want to believe in, in, in that. And um, I, I, I've always been in the opinion that, you know, you want to be the person sort of driving that. You don't want someone to be saying, look, I think I've got this right, great idea, why don't you go off and do that? Yeah, and just to add a bit about the fellowships, um, you know, the system is tough. Uh, the NHMRC fellowship success rate, I think, is sort of about 10 or 20%. It's very low. Um, and I'm an NHMRC practitioner fellow, which is made for a clinician scientist, but now people getting that, they're always associate professors and professors. When I started, I was the first year that they were, the first six that were awarded first year, I was one of those, and I was a doctor in those days, not an associate professor, not a professor, and the hurdles just, the bars just kept climbing. So I think this is a huge problem, and I think the NHMRC is very aware of it. Um, and we now have the Medical Research Future Fund, which is just beginning to roll out some funds. And one of the aims of that, if you look at their, uh, what they've decided, is to grow pre uh, clinical clinician scientists. So I think the space is going to become easier, but we have a lot of talent in this country and still a lot of very talented people aren't getting funded. The other issue is around project grants, and they're hard. And I think one of the things you have to do is think outside the NHMRC 
looked at the ARC, that's the Australian Research Council. They won't do anything on health, but if you can turn it into science, they'll think about it. So I've had one ARC grant on speech, um, on speech biology with Angela Morgan. Um, I think you can look at, this was the Sir Edward Dunlop Foundation at the Austin has got grants. You can get small grants for whatever area. You can look overseas. A lot of the, um, uh, your disease group might have its own grants, be they European or American, and they'll fund outside. So you do have to be creative to get funding and not to get too disheartened about it. Some more questions? Oh, yeah, sorry. Leary Dunlop uh, Medical Research Foundation does have a uh, number of grants for early career researchers um, for project work. So it's a great opportunity, and they recognise that it's, it's a difficult time for researchers, so you could apply for those. Um, they're usually uh, in early uh, on the, uh, the other thing, um, the other foundation that really helped me is the Viertel uh, yes, Foundation. Yes, so the is a good one. Yeah, and the College of Physicians has a um, number of grants, um, and also like Diabetes Australia Research Trust, Stroke Foundation, that they've been um, smaller. Sometimes you feel like you're... will have their internal so, grants too, won't they? So, you know, yeah. Murdoch, my initial postdoc, uh, my initial PhD scholarship was from MCRI, and then I got it in HMRC. I got seed grants for the Barwon Infant Study from MCRI and from Barwon Health, and then philanthropic grants, and then in HMRC grants. So there's, there's often good internal opportunities as well. Yeah, and in fact, my autism genetics study started with Barwon and with Peter Hewson, who recently died, a wonderful paediatrician. And we went to Rotary and, oh no, it was the Brockhoff Foundation. And the Brockhoff Foundation funded us for $100,000 a year for three years, and they were really engaged because it was community. It wasn't the Children's Hospital, it wasn't the Murdoch, it wasn't the University of Melbourne, but because it was Barwon Health. And that really got us kick-started, which then got us our um, NHMRC grants, and we're now on our, our third in that program. There's a question at the back. Yes. Hi, thanks for the panel discussion. Um, just following up from your comment, Ken, um, about the startup culture in the United States, um, what role do you see clinician scientists take in things like startups or medical technology, for example, um, artificial intelligence research? Uh, look, I mean, I think that uh, clinicians have an important part to play in, in um, developing startups because, you know, in working with patients, you can see what the sort of clinical needs are. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, if someone's coming from a basic science background, they may not see those applications as clearly as someone with a clinical background. So, for example, I was at a, I wanted to speak at a conference a couple of weeks ago where this person had this sort of amazing technology, they called it sort of electronic skin. You could sort of put it on your body, it could um, take your heart rate, it could do an ECG, and when you put it on a face, it was able to sort of help diagnose, or it could um, classify whether or not you had autism or not based on like facial movements and other things. But he was like, I have no idea what to do with this. You know, I'm looking for clinicians to help me figure out applications for this technology. Like, I'm a technologist and, uh, you know, he said, but I don't know what to do with this. So I think as a clinician, you know, if you're interested in sort of technology, you can really help those sorts of startups navigate that. At the same time, you know, startups, you know, with time will want to start to, um, you know, partner with industry and uh, move into sort of clinical trials. And again, there's sort of roles for, you know, clinicians at, at that point. Um, yeah, I've um, been able to successfully collaborated with some engineers from um, RMIT and um, and Swinburne, um, and I think there's really good opportunities there. Um, what, and what have you done with them? What have they done? Oh, um, so they have uh, this um, camera, which is like hyperspectral imaging. That can well, I can't maybe not talk about it too much, but um, it's a quite interesting uh, way of detecting what the underlying. Um, you know, pathogens are at the base of um, the ulcer in diabetic feet. Um, and also um, the other project we have is like looking at big data in terms of hospital admissions related to diabetes. Um, there's a lot of interest in that. And also nanotechnology um, and ways of diagnosing like say kidney disease, um, yeah, and in diabetic patients. So if you tell us too much, you'll have to kill us, is that right? <laughs> Did you get in trouble? Yeah, yeah Ruth. So, um, I think it's important to note that, um, like, in terms of startups and biotech and all that sort of space, we have to be honest, the fact is Australia is not the best environment to get some of those things off the ground. But at the same time, you do see them getting off the ground. So they, I'm aware of a, sort of two or three 
uh, surgical trainees who've actually left surgical training because they had like a super good idea and they've gone off to try and make their dream a reality and they're finding the support to do that. So again, I can't tell you because I'd have to kill you. But um, but there but there are there are things that happen and there are projects that get off the ground here and um, I think that that will change. I think it will become better and better. Um, there are you know more attention being paid by traditional sort of um, you know institutions like universities to to accelerators and startup sort of environments and I think that we'll see a real shift um, in the next sort of decade in this city in particular. So it's exciting. We'll see what happens. Andrew, can I ask you just to comment about your thinking about startups and things since you work in the industry space? Um, no, uh, thanks. <laughs> no. Um, look, I, 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 it's a complex topic. I agree it hasn't been nearly as powerful in Australia as, say, the east or west coast of the US, you know, in, in the last 10 or 15 years. But, but with the initiative from the Turnbull government to create the Biomedical Translation Fund, which was one of those innovation things that actually got pushed through almost in, in spite of the government, it, it, it's going to provide $500 million over the next five to eight years to start companies, which will need to be staffed by skilled people. And the whole idea is to start companies that are properly capitalised, so $100 million startup, not a $10 million startup that goes broke after a year. Um, with the whole idea of going into clinical development in Australia and keeping the good ideas here and adding value to them in Australia. So, uh, look, I, I think we have to be optimistic that the next 10 years will be much more powerful and exciting and will create a whole lot of uh, clinical development roles in, in Australia. I think but, but people need to be trained to be able to do that, of course. Yeah. That's the kind of... Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's a well-recognised valleys of death, two valleys of death that come with development of new technologies, and I think these funds are going to hopefully help people to straddle those. Oh, and well, and as, as was mentioned before, I'd just say in this city with BioCurate and the biomedical translation fund, they're, they're attempting to address both of those valleys quite specifically. That's great. Thank you. More questions? Yes, Edward. Um, I have a question. Um, obviously, medical training takes quite a long time, and a lot of you, you were suggesting that maybe the time to do a PhD is just when you start to feel vaguely competent in something. So how do you, recognize, how do you sort of reconcile, or prepare for, or endure um, uh, taking that leap and then starting from scratch, basically, as an as a infant again, when you sort of almost reach the panacea of finally having some competence in an area, i.e. being a consultant? So I'm going to ask our neurosurgeon to start with that. Mm. Thank you. I think it's a great question. I think, you know, certainly I can attest to the fact that starting my PhD, I felt like a newborn baby who, like, didn't know anything. And I found it very difficult to manage like my emotions, I felt like a child because I would have this thing where my cell prep would turn into glue. And I'm like, why? And I couldn't understand why it wasn't working. And I would ask five different people, why do you think this happened to my cells? Why did this happen? And I would get five different answers. And then I realized nobody knows. And at least in the hospital when someone's really sick, there's someone smarter than you grown upper than you, you can call and they'll like, no, well, it's because they're acidotic, Ruth. That's why, you know, here's what you're going to do and fix it. And you're like, oh, right, okay, great. There's like no grown up in the lab. You're the grown up. You're the only person who's done this experiment. It was probably the wrong experiment. And now you have to decide what to do. And I found that very like humiliating and frustrating. And I realized at one point I was on the verge of tears because of what my experiment wasn't doing. And I was more upset about that than I would be about a really unwell patient that I didn't know how to manage. And I thought, right, I've got to back up from this. This is crazy. And I think the trouble is when you're a clinician going into the lab, you're used to, like, everything has to go well. It, you know, you can't miss anything on the ward round. You can't leave any bleeding in the operation. You, you know, it's not OK to have to do six goes to get the cannula in. You hold yourself to a very high standard. But you can't hold your cells to that standard. Like, it doesn't work like that. And so if you have to relearn what success looks like and what expectations should be. And I have found that the most 
useful skills in getting through that process have been having really good supports. So there are a couple of other PhD students who are also clinicians in different fields from me who started at the same time that I did it at the WEHI. And we pretty regularly go for lunch and have a debrief. And just as when I was an intern, I found it so important to catch up at the end of the week with my friends that I'd gone through med school with and have a bit of a, you know, a, a bitch and a gossip and a, like, a debrief and cry about the patient that died and the mistake you made and the bollocking you got and all that sort of thing. I have found it really important to talk to these you know, fellow sojourners on this you know, clinician scientist's journey and realize you're not alone. Everyone's got their frustrations with it. And it gets better. It gets better as you go along because you figure out what you're doing and, be, and you get better at doing your science. But it, it, it definitely is a challenge. And, and you can't do it on your own. Anyone else like to add to this? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I remember feeling that way, um, and yeah, I think it's actually really hard. I remember feeling that way, having young kids, and just feeling really frustrated, and um, I remember thinking, oh God, I'm, I'm really not very patient with this, you know, and I think it's this thing, because you, you get used to being so efficient um, as a doctor, and you get to that where you're just efficient, you're just trying to do it better and, you know, you get... And then you have to learn everything again. You have to, you know, in the st you have to learn the stats program again, you have to do this, oh, the whole thing's not right, you, you know. Uh, for me, it was, uh, yeah, that, that frustration. I think um, um, I would, yeah, recommend um, not getting so upset about things. Hey. <laughs> I guess the one thing I think that's similar about your clinical training and that clinical course and then going into research is you have to get familiar and comfortable with failure. I mean, there's no... I don't think I've ever failed as any, at anything as much as I did, perhaps, you know, I can think of a few, but heading into your physician exams, you've got to, you've got to fail a lot of short cases and a, long, a lot of long cases before you're going to get through that physician exam and science is the same. So you go, you've got to enter it in with us with that with a sort of level of comfort with the fact that you're not always going to get A plus and that you are going to fail and that's how you get there. Okay, one more question. I just wanted to oh, there's one at the back if you go down there, but I just want to uh, make sure we have a <coughs> chat about this. And if we talked about other grants, and I know at NHMRC they're keen to fund Indigenous research, and you have done that. Can you tell us about the challenges of Indigenous research and, you know, why it's worth... I mean, you sort of said why it's worth doing, but maybe what you've got from it. Yeah, um, so we're doing... Um, well, several projects. One of them is in remote Central Australian communities where, um, well, it's hard to do any type of research, but to find, I guess the thing... Why the, is it hard to do any type of well, research? Well, it's, it's, um, it's hard because um, it has to be done properly um, and carefully and because there's been history of research which hasn't been done properly. Um, but also people are very... They have major problems, like in terms of, um, you know, medical problems that need attention often, um, and other major issues that are happening in their life. That and that's not really a priority for people who are. You so know, the psychosocial problems are getting in way of medical research. Yes, research, yes. So, and also being um, partly, it's also family, you know, issues. Um, Medical, you know, medical problems within family, or it's for for older women often caring for younger children. So, um, it's it's difficult uh, to do that, but uh, uh, to do research and to you know, when people say yes, they'll participate in something, it, they may not be able to come physically, even if they want to come back for, to have the follow up. Um, uh, you know, so there's that that difficulty um, in terms of retention um, of of patients, but. Um, how um, I've been able to... I mean, I've been going to the same community um, for the last six years, um, the one particular community, so that, that's that been a great... Um, because the patients, you know, the people who are there uh, with you. diabetes, they know me, and they, they we've got this level of trust. You know, they know I know them, I know their children, and uh, we have other... You know, when I go there, I don't, we don't just do the clinical work, we also do cultural things, um, you know, often together, uh, sit around campfire and... Um, and and uh, so have that type of uh, experience, and and people do when they see me, they talk to me, and you know, they, it's sort of they they trust me in that sense, and and um, that's helped. But again, you know, you can't sort of 
use that to do the research either. Like, there's that sort of challenge where, you know, it has to be really consent um, completely from the person. And so the person who's consenting the... the, the uh, the participants have to not not be myself. Obviously, it has to be someone else, the research assistant. But there has to be a level of, um, I think, trust. Thank you. Now we'll take that last question at the back. I think. Um, so it's been mentioned uh, what the optimal time to do a PhD was, and so I was just wondering what your thoughts were on doing a PhD before your MD degree, and uh, if there were any advantages to it, to doing it before or after like specific advantages such as scholarships or? Oh, about doing a PhD before. Sorry, it's really fuzzy. I don't know why. Um, so sh should you do a PhD before your medical career? That's the question. Advantages. It's advantages to do a PhD oh, okay. before. Advantages to doing it before. Uh, I, I might. Um, one of my collaborators did do that, and um, it's actually really been great for him because he he's been able to publish all throughout his medical years, and you know um, he's had lots more publications, and um, I think he's had that time also that pure dedicated time to his research before all the clinical stuff. And you bring that refined thinking about hypothesis-driven yeah, yeah. research and, and methods and really thinking about it correctly. Does anyone else want to talk about it? Ruth? Um, so I think I, I'm sometimes slightly envious of people who've already got their PhD, like you lot. Because um, I've just... <laughs> I've got a lot of writing ahead of myself in the next six months. Um, and I think there are advantages to doing your PhD before you go to med school. But I know that if I'd done that, I would have done my PhD in renal physiology. And I'm glad I didn't do that. Um, and so the other thing I would say is that in terms of the scholarships available for people who have a medical degree, um, there are certainly more scholarships available and they tend to be more generous than those available for people who haven't got a medical degree. Um, and I think that's um, like not an insignificant factor because you have to like eat and pay the rent. And so I think that that's uh, like something that people don't often think about. Um, but is actually a real thing. And so, for example, I have a College of Surgeons scholarship um, and the NHMRC scholarships, which are for clinicians, are, are more money than the ones for people who aren't. So, you know, there are factors like that. And you can also do a bit of clinical work on the side while you're doing your PhD. Um, and that helps with the way you're thinking about your research as well as paying the bills. So I think that um, there, there are certainly are very significant advantages to doing it that way. Yeah, for surgeons, they can do all that assisting, can't they? So that's great. Yes, although if you do a lot of assisting, you don't get very many experiments done, so you have to be careful. Well, I think that's been a fabulous discussion. Please join with me in thanking our fantastic panel. So I think, I think we'll let the panel sit there just for a moment longer while I close. I just wanted to thank you all for coming. I hope you realise that these speakers that you've heard today are the absolute top of Australian health and medical research. Um, and, you know, I think I mentioned Steve Davis. I heard him speak recently because he got the top program grant. I heard Stephen Tong speak recently because he got the top ECF and CDF, so two different fellowships. Um, so you really have heard the, the, the best. And I think you could hear a lot of the themes that came through, I hope, will help you to think about your careers. You need to appreciate they have given up their weekend time, and we have very little weekend time, so that is very good of them to do that for us. Um, and I think they're doing this because they believe in growing you, the next generation of clinician scientists. I know sometimes you think, oh, we just have a talk we can pull on. That's not the case. This sort of talk is a different sort of talk. You heard Steve this morning saying he was a bit nervous about giving this sort of talk. And I think it just shows that we don't often talk about our own vulnerabilities. You know, we talk science. That's a lot easier than talking about how my career went wrong. And I think you've got to appreciate that it's very kind of them to share those vulnerabilities with us. And also how they've all illustrated to you their resilience. Um, and, you know, that's part of what makes them great clinician scientists. You also heard beautiful talks. I want you to go to the next conference you go to or meeting and hear how many crummy talks there are and just realise that these people gave you beautiful talks. And 
Beautiful talks are about communication science, but also with your patients. If you're a good clinician, you communicate well, you communicate at their level, and you make it into plain English, no matter what level that should be. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I hope it's given you some exposure to incredible role models, and they're not everywhere, these role models, and I think they show you how it's important to think laterally outside the box, but that we can therefore have a, a, a stimulating career in this world where you're mixing clinical work and science. I wanted also to thank the poster tour leaders. Um, I think it was great how many of you came on those tours. I saw most of the room was going around and hopefully the different institutes were happy that they got some of your time because they all want you as their next PhD student. Um, and I hope you saw there are many different ways to do science, different environments and different types of places. Um, you have feedback forms, and Aidan's going to tell you about them a bit more in the morning, uh, in a moment. I want you to reflect, why did you get this for just $20? Why was it so cheap? This is the reason it was so cheap, all our sponsors. The actual food was at least $60, just to let you know, let alone the room. And so I wanted to thank particularly the Melbourne Convention Centre, because they are subsidising this to a fair degree. Um, now, if you heard a pearl that you want to hear again, the good news is we've had a gentleman out the back who's working really hard, and he's videoed the whole thing, and it will be on the Australian Academy of Health and Medical uh, Sciences website, and you can go back and relive the experience or tell your friends who missed out why they should have got out of bed. And um, finally, I want you to thank with me, Aidan, because he has the most amazing frontal lobes. You have never seen organisation like this young man can do. And uh, as well as that, he brings intellect and enthusiasm. So join with me in thanking Aidan. <laughs> So thank you all very much for coming along to Life as a Clinician Scientist. Um, I'm really happy with how it's all turned out. I think you've heard from some amazing speakers and I'm really happy to see how much you've engaged with them as well. The, I think the poster tours worked really well. It was a good chance for you guys to talk to the speakers in a smaller group setting and see what kind of research goes on in this state. And those poster tours and the research institutes were actually um, a suggestion from the feedback forms last year. So we really do look at these and we really hope that you write down what you liked about the day and what you perhaps think we could improve. You might notice there's it was a bit of a miscommunication between me and the printer when I selected to do half-page prints, but that just leaves you extra, extra space to write a few more of your thoughts. So hopefully we get some full feedback forms. But yeah, thanks, thanks very much for coming along. Thanks to all our speakers. Thanks to our panel members. And most importantly, thanks very much to Ingrid for, again, driving this forward for the second year in a row, and we really hope this continues into the future under her guidance. So thank you very much.